The unusual building behind me is Semaphore Tower. It's like an air traffic control centre for all the ship movements around Portsmouth Naval Base. It's all hustle and bustle and noise and activity today because they're servicing ships as they have done for over 500 years. A walk around this place is a walk around British naval history. The story of Portsmouth Naval Dockyard starts during the reign of King Richard I in 1194 and it still goes on today. They're always building it and always changing it. It's an organic place that reflects the nature of history. Now it was very good to pick Spithead as the place to start to build warships because of the natural mudflats and the way in which the Isle of Wight protects the area from the tide. So what do they do at the very beginning? They dragged the timber up onto the mudflats, laid the keel and constructed the framework to make what were primitive battleships. But as the ships grew and the technology developed, they needed better ways to build them, maintain them and make sure that they were up to standard for the demands of war. By 1765, this beautiful beast behind me was the ultimate sailing technology. Nelson's flagship Victory. Now that's what the Portsmouth Naval Dockyard is all about. It's changing and developing to cope with the design of warships. As the ships developed, the yard changed. It went from a few pieces of rough hewn timber lying on the mud to all the computer technology that powers Her Majesty's Navy today. This is the Great Stone Dry Dock, the first of its kind anywhere in the world. It was built in the middle of the 17th century during the reign of Charles II, when the Navy was expanding at a phenomenal rate. In fact, the King was the first person to formalise it into the Royal Navy that we know today. So they needed ways to service their warships properly. So they built this magnificent work of civil engineering, alongside which is a wet dock. Now this is the wet dock. I'll explain in a moment why it's enclosed. It's absolutely enormous and cavernous. It stretches way, way off into the darkness there, and way, way, way beneath me here as well, where I can hear the water. Now, the story goes like this. By the end of the 18th century, the change of the tidal flow, the rise and the fall, was inadequate to drain the dry dock. So it was decided that the wet dock would become a reservoir to drain the dry dock into. So once it was no longer being used as a wet dock and simply as a reservoir, a building could be put over it. So Sir Samuel Bentham, the famous engineer, built a building, a factory building, that's very significant in the development of the Industrial Revolution. These things are called blocks, and they were used in the Navy for lifting all manner of things like sails and cannons. They came in all sizes, from tiny little ones to huge ones like this for the great big heavy sails. Now, they were handmade, and the process of making them was very labour intensive. Until Bentham built this building over the wet dock. It's a wonderful building. It's, it's made out of timber, really using the same sort of technology as they would have used to make boats. Now, after Bentham, along came Mark Brunel, who introduced woodworking machinery powered by steam, and in so doing, they invented the first production line in the world. 
Happily, a lot of the historic dockyard is open to the public. And when you come, and it is a great day out, you get in through the Victory Gate. It's the oldest gate and the wall that was built around the dockyard in 1711. Now, when it was built, it was only half this width, 12 feet. And in 1943, during the Second World War, it was enlarged to 22 feet. Now, Queen Anne was very proud of her navy and her dockyard, so she came to have a look-see for herself. And there's a plaque on the wall here to commemorate her visit. Over on the other side is a Victorian prison house for sailors who defaulted and didn't turn up for their duty and take the king's shilling. It's a very fine building with cast iron windows and well worthwhile a look. During the American War of Independence, a sympathiser decided to try and set fire to the dockyard. Happily, the fire was put out and he was caught, but he was strung up behind these gates on a 60-foot mast. They look like ordinary gates, but they've got some story to tell. This is the old Naval Academy of 1729. It's of particular interest and relevance because Lord Nelson learnt his navigation here. As you'll see, it has a, a dome on the top, probably used for stargazing. In other words, learning how to navigate by the stars and how to adjust the navigational aids like a sexton. Now, it is a very, very beautiful and considered Georgian building with a fine Doric door case with all the right details and brickwork that is particularly elaborate when looked at in detail. But from here, all that we need see is Georgian architecture at its best. In the 18th century, during the reign of King George III, the Navy expanded incredibly, principally to deal with the ongoing war with the French. Now, as the ships grew and changed in nature, so the buildings and the dockyard had to change to cope with them. New ships, new ship technology demanded new buildings, most of which were built towards the end of the 18th century. Now, behind me is the most magnificent building used for storage. Yes, they went to all that trouble with the architecture when it was principally to store goods and chattels. This building over here was designed for making rope. Now, rope has to be made in great lengths. It has to be very strong and continuous. So the building is long and continuous. So the rope could be laid out from one end to the other. Now, over here is a very similar building. Same sort of window details, same sort of brickwork but this building was used for storage. Now, because of that, it needed to be strengthened. The stored material weighed a great deal more than the rope. So what we have here are buttresses, which are similar to those used in medieval cathedrals, which means that the floor above on the first floor could be strong enough to take heavy loads. Now, the wonderful thing is that although these buildings were built at the end of the 18th century, they're still in use today. The rope house and all the storehouses are built of fine English brickwork. Not just English because it was laid by Englishmen, but English because of the way in which it's laid. The bonding of the brickwork, the way they fit together, is called English bond. Now, when you see the long side of a brick, it's called a stretcher. When you see the short end, it's called a header. In English bond, we get a course of stretchers, and a course of headers. Now, this is a very pleasing proportion and suits these utilitarian buildings very well indeed. That bonding makes the brickwork inherently strong. And then above my head, just as a nice little frisson, we see the initials and crest of George III. This small area of water is called the Mast Pond. It's looking particularly disgusting at the moment. It isn't normally like this, but there's construction work going on. Now, it fulfilled two very important functions. First of all, timber for new masts were stored underwater before being made into masts. Once they became grown-up masts, they were stored in these buildings, beautiful clapboarded buildings, rather like you see in New England today. Now, the second function was to act as a holding bay for boats that were brought from the harbour through a tunnel before being transported up and into the boathouse. Now, this is a wonderful building with a tremendously rich story to tell. 
Let's have a look at the floor first of all. Where they pull the boats in, there are heavy granite sets to take the load. In between the granite sets, there are blocks of timber like this making up the floor. Believe it or not, it isn't hardwood, it's actually softwood. Now, having looked at the floor, let's now look at the beams. These boats are enormously heavy, and they're even dragged up through this opening to first floor level. The cast iron beams sit on cast iron columns. Now, the beams slot together on the top of the columns. It's actually a very simple system. Each of the beams is capable of carrying 40 tons. To be capable of doing this, the beams have to be, as it were, reinforced with cast iron strapping. Now, that's so that when the beam tends to bend under the weight of all the boats, there's extra tension on the bottom of the beam to help give it the strength necessary to carry the superimposed load of all those heavy boats. So it's much more than just a utilitarian building. It's a building in which new civil and structural engineering techniques were pushed to the limit. So the boats are made of wood and they carry high explosives. The whole place is just a sort of tinderbox. So what you need is a fire station. And this is the fire station built in 1844. Now, it's significant for two or maybe three reasons. Let's deal with the third one first. The upper story is a huge cold water storage tank. Now, the building is built out of cast iron, similar to the Crystal Palace built for the Great Exhibition of 1851. Wonderful round cast iron columns, which of course have to be extremely strong to carry the weight of water above. So cast iron is its second virtue. Its third is the fact that it's clad in what is now a very unfashionable material, which at the time was actually mould-breaking. It's clad in corrugated iron, probably the first time it's ever been used. <laughs>